Welcome to Wider View, the program that provides perspectives on the news outside the narrow confines of the mainstream media. I'm your host, Charles Dunaway. I'm very pleased to welcome Leith Marouf to Wider View. Leith is a Canadian journalist and activist who has served as national chair of the group Solidarity for Palestinian Human Rights, executive director of Concordia University Television in Montreal, and is a senior consultant to the Community Media Advocacy Center there. Leith Marouf currently lives in Beirut, Lebanon, where he is a geopolitical and media analyst. I knew Leith was on the road, so I began by asking him where exactly he was. Uh, I am uh, in Damascus. I'm on the street called Strait. Uh, that's in uh, Damascus Old City. Street called Strait is called that because it is where Saul, uh, when he was chasing uh, the Christians uh, on behalf of the Romans uh, out of Palestine to Damascus, uh, is where the uh, original Christians hid in all the uh, um, grettos under Mm -hmm. the old houses. And uh, by the end of the street, uh, he kept on, you know, um, the mythology is that he kept on going into the grettos and, you know, God would blind him and uh, he wouldn't be right. able to see the Christians. And by the end of the street, uh, he saw God and became a Christian and uh, <laughs> turned straight and uh, became St. Paul. Um, yes. That's the mythology here. So this is a uh, Christian part of the old city. Uh, there's a lot of churches around. Uh, there's a lot of mosques also, uh, but it was... Uh, you know the the uh, extent uh, uh, at at Bab Sharqi, which is means the eastern gate of the city, uh, where the uh, Wahhabi Contras were uh, uh, just across the highway from here. Uh, they were where they almost would have penetrated the uh, old city, and if they would have got into the uh, old city, there mm. was nothing that would have been able to get them out. Well, I, I thought I would start by asking you about you know, the current mood of the Syrian people there in Damascus uh, after this U.S. pullout or partial pullout, whatever it is, and uh, and the Turkish offensive and and the uh, you know Syrian Arab army regaining a lot of land. Apparently, what, how are yes. people feeling about this? Well, I can tell you that people are. Um very uh, jubilant about this. Uh, you know, it's one of the happiest moments that the Syrian people have had in the last eight years. Obviously, it was, uh, you know, people were very happy uh, in the liberation of Aleppo and uh, the liberation of Palomera and Deir Zor uh, city, uh, breaking the siege of that. But, you know, seeing that uh, a secessionist, uh, colonialist uh, settler project that was going to be uh, built on Arab and Assyrian lands uh, in uh, northeast Syria to see it uh, coming crumbling um, so fast. Uh, people are very jubilant about that, and they can uh, see the end uh, of this uh, uh, imperialist colonialist war on uh, Syria. Uh, what we're seeing here in the U.S. media is basically two interpretations of what's going on there. Uh, and the first story we t- see a lot is uh, how Trump has abandoned the noble, freedom-loving Kurdish people who are our close allies, uh, proving that the U.S. is an unreliable partner. Now, while I I might agree that the U.S. is an unreliable partner, uh, nothing new there, but this idea of the noble, freedom-loving Kurds, is that that realistic, or are we being sold something there? Look, I, I, you know, there's a difference between, obviously, the Kurdish people and the Kurdish uh, Contras or militias, whatever you want to call them. You know, uh, we wish and hope uh, equality and uh, freedom for every people in this world. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, you know, there's a uh, innate racism in this idea of uh, building a 
uh, romanticized, uh, uh, non-existent uh, land called Rojava, a, a, a Narnia kind of situation um, in uh, northeast Syria, in Hasaka, in Raqqa, in Derizor. These are lands that are traditionally uh, lands of the indigenous Canaanite, Arabs, and Assyrians. Uh, you know, the Kurdish people, their indigenous land is the Kurdish mountain range that stretches from uh, Turkey to uh, Iran. And not uh, one uh, inch of that is anywhere near Syria. That's like mm. uh, the, the, you know, 400 kilometers uh, north of uh uh, the state we call now Syria. So uh, to to watch uh, all these uh, progressive, supposed progressive people uh, in the West uh, cheer for a, uh, a colonialist project uh, that is on the equivalency of of Israel, where a people that are oppressed somewhere else that uh, don't have a land or a state somewhere else are made to build a state uh, on uh, the Arab lands of uh, greater Syria. This is like a repetition of uh, 1948 would have been if it wasn't for the success right now that we see of the Syrian army and the Syrian uh, people and their uh, resistance to this. Well, what about the um, the Turkish government, the Turkish army's uh, incursion into northern Syria, they see the, the Kurdish militias as a threat to their their sovereignty and, and their national security. And, and a lot of people here are talking about the possibility of some kind of ethnic cleansing going on by the Turks uh, of the Kurds in northern Syria. I mean, is that realistic? Well, you know, uh, Erdogan and his brand of, uh, you know, Muslim Brotherhoods has been always a uh, tool of imperialism. You know, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood was uh, created by the British in the 1940s to fight uh, Arab nationalism, Arab socialism that uh, would have uh, uh, led to a united Arab state uh, spanning the lands that are traditionally Arabic from from Iraq to Morocco. And so, uh, you know, since the 1940s, uh, this has been the role always of the Muslim Brotherhood is to undermine the possibility of a secular, democratic, socialist, uh, Arab unified state uh, by uh, creating this brand of Islam, Isla, Is, you know, Islamic uh, um, polit politicization. So, uh, you know, on the one hand, it may look like uh, that uh, Erdogan is doing something that is uh, not in the interest of empire, of Western empire. But in reality, uh, because, you know, the Syrian army was on the verge of clearing uh, Idlib and Aleppo uh, of the Wahhabi Contras uh, that are occupying it that are funded by Turkey and Qatar and Saudi Arabia on behalf of the United States, then the logical thing was uh, the only parts that will, would have been left for the Syrian people and the Syrian army to liberate would have been uh, the northeast. And, you know, given the fact that uh, uh, Kurdish uh, people and the militias that are claiming to represent them are a very small minority in the northeast, in Raqqa and Hasaka and Derizor, uh, it, it would have been a, 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 a very easy job for the Syrian army to conduct. And, you know, also because of the geography, it's a flat land, it's not like the hills and, and mountains mm -hmm. uh, uh, in Idlib and uh, North Aleppo. So, you know, if you think about it, uh, you know, Trump was trying to allow a army of a state to replace a small militia, a small contra that couldn't withstand the a uh, push of the Syrian army for the liberation of the area. You know, Erdogan was actually trying to achieve uh, a gain for the empire, and fortunately for the Syrian people, because of the innate racism that is there against Arabs in general. Uh, and that now you have the elites in the empire in the United States cannibalizing each other and calling each other name names. And it's like a chicken without a head 
uh, you know, flailing uh, and not knowing which of their tools, whether it's Erdogan and his, his, uh, his Muslim Brotherhood, British contrast, are they going to support? The other major uh, theme we get from U.S. mainstream media on this is that by pulling out, uh, Trump has given a gift to Russia and Iran uh, and strengthened their hand. And, um, you know, that that seems to actually be the case. Um, uh, but what do you think the role of, uh, of the Russians is going to be at this point? Well, it's up in the air right now. Uh, we're, we're all waiting to see how will Russia be able to uh, give a ladder for Erdogan to uh, climb down from the high horse that uh, he's uh, ridden into Syria. So, uh, you know, I know it's 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 very rare for people in the West to. Um, have uh, access to the speeches or the media that is happening in Turkey. Uh, but, uh, you know, yesterday uh, Erdogan was speaking about the occupation uh, and an invasion of North Syria, comparing it to the invasion and occupation of Cyprus and North Cyprus. And mm-hmm. so uh, he is he's speaking to the Turkish people in a nationalistic uh, way to speak about uh, this. So how is this man is projecting himself with people as a new sultan of going down uh, from this horse, especially in this situation where NATO and uh, the EU and the US are uh, all abandoned. So uh, now it's all up to Erdogan. Uh, are we going to have uh, for the first time a war between uh, armies of, for the past eight years, it's been militias and contras uh, versus the state of Syria and its army, and so we're moving now to a new stage. And this is where you recognize people should recognize in the United States that Trump was actually doing something that is pro-imperial by withdrawing from there, uh, by abandoning these Kurdish militias. But because of the racism, the innate racism that is in the uh, whole establishment in the United States, where you see them even not recognizing that uh, what Trump did uh, would have probably, you know, if the EU and uh, NATO would have backed uh, Turkey, would have been a huge quagmire for Russia and Syria. So, but thankfully, you know, this internal civil war that is happening within the empire and its uh, elite and its uh, provinces is is saving Syria. So I'm glad. Mm-hmm. I'm glad that uh, the, the Democrats and the Republicans are are stabbing each other in public. <laughs> well, it's interesting because we had we had a uh, Democratic presidential candidate debate uh, yesterday. Twelve people on the stage, and only one of the twelve uh, had anything uh, remotely accurate to say about the situation in Syria. Uh, any exhibited any real understanding um, of of what actually is going on there, and that was Tulsi Gabbard, who has virtually no chance of uh, getting the nomination. Uh, so, I think this is the one area, you know, when it comes to imperialism, uh, that's that's one thing on which the elites tend to agree. I mean, they disagree about the methods for achieving it. It seems, but what what yes. is you know, when you when you talked about Trump uh, actually doing the empire a favor uh, by withdrawing, how how would that ha- how is that? You know, imagine a situation where the United States withdraws and abandons these these contras, the Kurdish contras, and at the same time NATO backs Turkey. So then the situation would have led to uh, Syria having to fight all of NATO. And then Russia having to make a choice. Is it going to go into direct war with NATO, which would have led to world war? So, you see, this is where Trump was calculating. But I think he missed the fact that, you know, racism trumps all <laughs> in the in, in the empire. And so uh, even though that Erdogan has, you know, for the last 10 years have been basically begging the West to allow him into the club of whiteness, 
uh, he has been rejected, and uh, so that's that's another symptom of of seeing where uh, the lines of racism sometimes um, over over uh, power lines of class and uh, and and imperial objectives. So, in a way, uh, you know, Syria with its uh, you know this long-term resistance that was standing it with its allies, with its Hezbollah and Iran and Russia, uh, have uh, made the whole empire crumble. And uh, people in the West, if they are really progressive, should be thankful for every sacrifice uh, that the uh, you know Syrian people have put forward in the last eight years for the sacrifices of the Syrian army and for the steadfastness of the Syrian uh, leadership uh, because without that, uh, Syria would have been chopped up into statelets and Palestine would have taken another hundred years to be liberated. Uh, we would have seen more. We would have seen Venezuela being attacked. We would have seen Bolivia being attacked. We would have seen Cuba being attacked. And, you know, after all these smaller uh, uh, independent sovereign states would have been out of the picture, then it would have been the turn of China and Russia. So today, I can, uh, you know, without uh, any shame, I can say that Syria is saving the world and saving humanity. You're listening to Leith Marouf, a geopolitical and media analyst, speaking to me from a cafe in Damascus, Syria. And you're listening to Wider View, a weekly conversation with analysts and activists rarely found on the mainstream media. Wider View is made available free of charge to radio stations nationwide, and the podcast of this show is available on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play Music as Wider View Radio and at widerviewradio.podbean.com. You can also follow us on Facebook at Wider View Radio. Yeah, you're certainly not going to hear that anywhere in the media here in the United States, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, you know, because what we're hearing, uh, what we're hearing too, I mean, the New York Times uh, yesterday noted, uh, uh, had an article about the 4 million Syria, Syrians who lived in the area that was being controlled by the U.S. and its proxies. And they're now concerned about their fate in the hands of the repressive Syrian government. I'm seeing also in my social media videos of people um, celebrating the arrival of the Syrian Arab army in the streets. So which is it? So first off, I want to say that saying 4 million people live in northeast Syria is a, a huge exaggeration. You know, uh, Syria prior to the war on it, uh, had a 22 million population, um, and uh, you know we know that uh, around uh, four million are out now of the country as uh, externally displaced. But the majority of the rest of the Syrians moved to the areas that are in the uh, under the control of the Syrian uh, government. So. Uh, prior to the war, the, uh, Damascus itself, the population of the greater Damascus region was 5 million. Now, where I'm standing here, it's 10 in the city of Damascus. So it's now Ten. some, you know, yeah. So if you're saying 10 million in the, and we've lost 4 million that are refugees around the world. So we're down to 18 million. 10 million are in the city of Damascus. And the rest are on the coast. Uh, so how can you, I, you know, I'm from Deir Zor, uh, where, you know, the, the, the oil fields are, where all this, you know, right now the, the, the current uh, battle is happening. And I can tell you that every member of my extended family, four steps away extended, have moved to Damascus. Mm -hmm. Damascus, yeah. And so I know, yeah, so so I know that Deir Zor, uh and Hasaka and Khamishli were practically emptied. Not only 
because of the attacks of ISIS at one point, but because also the Kurdish militias, the Kurdish Contras targeted the Arab and the Syrian population there to depopulate the villages so they can move in uh, Kurdish uh, migrants from mm-hmm. Iraq and Turkey to, to change the demographics. So there is no way there is there's 4 million people that are living in Hasaka, Qamishli, and, and um, Raqqa, and, and uh, the resort. There's, there's, you know, it, th- these are exaggerated numbers, number one. Number two, you know, the you know, as you said, there's huge demonstrations that of celebrating the the Syrian army entering uh, the area, and and it's it's spontaneous. It's in every town, in every big city, and that's you know been visually confirmed in videos. And uh, you know, the Americans don't like it, but this is the reality on the ground. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I <clears throat> that's. I'm glad to hear that. I'm, I'm hearing that from everyone who is in Syria or who has spent a lot of time in Syria, and I hear the the opposite from the mainstream media, who is probably in a hotel in Beirut or somewhere. Um, so one one last thing I want to talk about. This is the other bugaboo that we are fed here by the media is that uh, that Trump's move here and the um, the reduction of the U.S. presence is going to cause a great rise in the uh, strength of ISIS, uh, that ISIS prisoners are escaping, and that ISIS will be reborn uh, somewhere else um, as a result of this <clears throat> um, this U.S. departure from northern Syria. Um, now, is that do you do you think that's an accurate judgment? Well, you know, look, if you understand that ISIS and Al-Qaeda are all uh, militias that are operated by intelligence forces, uh, specifically Saudi, Qatar, and Turkey, on behalf of the imperial, uh, you know, masters, then you also understand that, uh, you know, this is the reason why we haven't seen somebody like, let's say, uh, Al Baghdadi being caught or assassinated or killed, or that we haven't even seen ever a footage of Osama bin Laden being killed. The truth is, the leadership of these these Wahhabi Contras are all uh, intelligence assets. Maybe the grunts on the ground are individuals that uh, that are confused or or or, or have an illusion that. Uh, a Wahhabi uh, state will will lead them to to uh, freedom or something like this, and or are paid grunts that will go with money wherever it goes. So once you understand that, uh, then you know that actually, you know, uh, these assets will move with the money and or the orders. And what does that mean? That means that. Only when a uh, intelligence agency like the one in Saudi Arabia or in Qatar or in Turkey or the CIA tells them to commit a, uh, a crime, a war crime, then they will commit it. So right now, this is the truth. Uh, and uh, if the Europeans and Americans uh, want to take their assets, uh, they should have taken them. And this is what the Syrian people wanted them to do. Take them back to Europe, put them in your jails, and let's see your Guantanamo Bays, uh, if they're better than uh, the Syrian Golags that they, that uh, the international media talks about. And definitely it is not. So uh, in reality, there is no threat of that, save for if the empire wants it to be a threat. That's an important thing for people to know. So we're about out of time. Maybe what I'll do is just ask you, is there anything else that uh, you think Americans ought to know about the situation there in Syria that we haven't already talked about? I want to say that Syria is beautiful. Syria is happy, is a place where a joyful place where Christians, Muslims, uh, Arabs, Assyrians, Druze, uh, Kurds, in in harmony and have lived there in harmony for centuries. It is 
up to the American people to understand that, to understand that we are the birthplace of Christianity, we are the birthplace of Judaism, we are the birthplace of Islam and Druze, and we have been like that for centuries. It is only when Western empires have came and forced on us these fake borders and forced on us these these minimalistic identities that we have had any problems. Leave us alone and we will rise and we will protect all this heritage, our heritage, and we will show you the right way to be a Christian. We'll show you the right way to be a Jew. We'll show you the right way to be a Muslim. Well, thank you very much, Leith. I really appreciate your taking the time with me today. And uh, it's exciting being able to talk to someone there in Damascus. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you okay. very much, Charles. Thanks again to Leith Maroof for joining me this week on Wider View. It was indeed a pleasure to be able to speak to someone actually on the ground in Syria with all that's been happening there. And I really appreciate his insights into what's really going on there because we keep hearing many different stories from the mainstream media. As always, the views expressed on Wider View are those of myself and my guests, and they may not reflect the views of the management of the radio station to which you're listening. Our aim is to provoke you to think outside the box and question the narratives you hear from the mainstream media and our national leaders. I hope we have succeeded. I'm your host, Charles Dunaway. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.